in my veins, oh, it's in my veins, it's in my veins, Lord, it's in my veins, oh, Lord, it's in my veins, Lord, it's in my veins, oh, while the blood is running warm, it's in my veins, oh, it's in my veins, it's in my vein, Lord, it's in my vein, oh Lord, it's in my vein, Lord, it's in my veins. And while the blood is running, oh, it's in my vein, oh, it's in my vein. We're going to pray. Now, I'm going to pray just a little over here, and I'm going to pray just a little over there. There. Oh, while the blood is running warm in my veins, oh, it's in my vein. We sing it's in my vein, it's in my vein, oh Lord, it's in my vein, Lord, it's in my veins. And while the blood is running warm, it's in my vein, oh. Is it? Here's the remix. Now I, I, I'm gonna shout just a little over here, and I'm gonna shout just a little over there. And while the blood is running warm, it's in my vein. Oh, it's in my veins. I said it's in my vein, Lord. It's in my veins. Oh, Lord, it's in my vein, Lord, it's in my vein, and while the blood is running warm, it's in my, here's a remix now, now if your brother, if your brother, he treats you wrong, you take it to your brother and God alone, and you say, brother, you treat me, but you fight on, and you fight on, oh Lord, you fight, you fight on now, you fight on, and you fight on and on, you fight on, and you fight on, and you are the blood in my veins running warm, in my veins, oh Lord, in my veins, and while the blood is running, just keep your hand, and keep your hand in God's hand, and while the blood is running warm, in my veins, oh, is in my vein. All right, Brother David. We got to work on that a little bit, but I hope that got it out your system. I hope it got it out your system. I want to invite your attention to Genesis 12. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 7. Our time is, is very short tonight. I want uh, it's going to get away from me. So I want to begin reading at Genesis 12 and verse number 7. The Bible says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give you this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent, uh, pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. We're going to continue reading in just a moment. Uh, but for those who have not been with us, uh, we have begun a series uh, on, on how we as Christians are still touched and influenced by the world. Uh, many of us uh, still have a lot of worldly tendencies and habits. And I want you to understand that as we learn to become Christ-like, it is a process. You do not get baptized on Sunday, and Monday you have it all together as a Christian. 
Uh, there are things you're going to have to learn sometimes the hard way. There are things you're not going to just automatically get. Sanctification, brothers and sisters, or being set apart and made holy is a process. It happens over time. Therefore, we ought to be uh, uh, understanding of new babes in Christ as they come to the Lord and still make mistakes. Uh, the sad part about it is a lot of us are old babes in Christ, uh, which is an oxymoron because ain't no such thing as an old baby. The problem is that we have still not let go of the very things in the world that influence us the most. What I want you to understand that when Brother Tyson talks about the world influencing you, I am not talking as much about the outside of parents as it is your inside. I am talking about your uh, disposition, your attitude, uh, the things that uh, determine how you make decisions in your life. Uh, I understand that uh, on the outside you can still look worldly and, and carry yourself uh, very worldly and, and that you uh, need to learn to trust God but there are some people that will fool you because on the outside they look saintly amen and on the inside they just as worldly as anybody else that you find on the street so I want you to understand at this particular point in the text Abraham has just made God his exclusive God uh, what that means is uh, 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 Joshua told us in Joshua 24 and verse number 2 that Terah and Abram and Nahor they had all served other gods of foreign gods and it's not until uh, Genesis chapter 12 in verse number 1 that God speaks to Abram and Abram listens to God and follows him it is at that point where the God of heaven becomes Abram's exclusive God he has now entered into a relationship with this God and he is going to trust this God of heaven to, to have his back and to provide for him and to give him those things uh, that he needs to survive and he has just now accepted or embraced the call of God on his his life but I want you to watch this now just because he has embraced the call of God does not mean that he's not going to trip and fall along the way I want us to understand that it is at this point where he is just now learning to lean on the Lord he's just now learning uh, to follow the ways of God so I want us to understand uh, that Abram is still very early uh, early on in the process and so he is going to make some mistakes I know y'all looking at me funny like what this boy gonna do with these cones uh, I, I, I want you to understand uh, that he is going to make some mistakes and so the Bible teaches us that uh, uh, God uh, calls him and says I want you to get out of your country because his family had stopped in Haran but God had a plan uh, for that family because he wanted that family to go to Canaan but for some reason Terah decided he was gonna dwell in Haran and so God calls Abram to go uh, to get his his family away from his daddy's house and get out of Haran and take your wife and those you're responsible for and all that you have and I want you to go uh, to a land that I will show you and God tells him in verses 1 through 3 that I will bless you I will make your name great uh, I will I will I will uh, 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 give you a, a great inheritance and you will have children and at this point Abram is 75 years old his wife is 65 years old they do not have any children and the Bible says that God uh, after he left showed him where Canaan was and he asked him he said look out uh, uh, in Canaan and the Bible says in, ch in chapter 12 verse number 5 and 6 uh, that there were Canaanites who were living in the land and God showed Abram he gave him a glimpse he said I want you to look out across this land this land I'm going to give to your descendants now that's a double portion blessing preacher how can you say that one one he recognized that his descendants are going to have that land two he recognized Recognize that even at 75, he's still going to have some descendants. Somebody going to say amen. Uh, God told him that it's the next generation to come. That's right. You're going to have a child and your children's children will enjoy this land. And so Abram, the Bible says, uh, builds an altar to the Lord. And we, 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 we came uh, to this conclusion last week uh, that, that Abram is marking God's territory. Uh, this, he, he's telling the Canaanites that the God I worship is the God of this land. And y'all might be living on it today. 
But the God I serve, the God I worship is going to give me this land. So you better be on notice that the God uh, that I serve is greater than your gods. The God I serve has got more power than your gods. And, and, and I don't care what y'all do. When you walk up on one of these altars, you will know who God is. And the Bible says that he that he went on a little further and between Bethel and Ai. I, he builds another altar and the Bible says he begins to call on the name of the Lord and that's the patriarchal way of saying that he worshiped God uh, 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 and so now we have God being worshiped and and the scriptures say uh, that he still was headed to the south now we all on the same page before we keep reading all right verse number 10 says now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there for the famine was severe in the land. Now, I got a problem with Abram. What's the problem that you have, preacher? God told him to go to Canaan. Famine struck. Ain't nobody told him to go to Egypt. That was his idea. I want you to watch something now. He's learning to trust God, but right now, he's still doubting the fact whether or not God can provide for him in the famine. Uh, some of y'all going to get this in a second. Uh, some of y'all going to get this in a second. Uh, it's going to make real sense to you in just a minute. So ain't nobody told him to go to Egypt. That was Abram's bright idea. Y'all see that? Uh, but, but one of the problems when we're marking our territory now, uh, if you're going to serve God and if you're going to trust God, you got to know that the God we serve is the God of your provision. Uh, uh, you know what that means? That means that God is going to provide no matter how bad things get. And many of us still have not trusted God to be the God of our provisions. That's right, with your finances. That's right, with your money. Some of us still don't trust God to provide for us when we're down to nothing. And you have to learn over time that God will never have you beg bread or go without. But the only way you're going to learn that is you're going to have to get down to scraping the bottom of the bed. Somebody going to help me preach this? Uh, and the reason why many of us don't know God as a provider is because he's always given to us and we ain't never had nothing. Amen, somebody. It's not until uh, uh, you down to little bit that you realize God can provide for you and your children. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody who knew their credit was messed up, but you walked in and filled out that application anyway, and they let you drive that car out the lot knowing you couldn't afford it, nor did you have credit to earn it. Amen. Uh, I remember we, Mid Jen and I, just got married. We went and saw Cal. Y'all know, go see Cal. Go see Cal. Amen. A a and when we got in our car, our car was on its last leg. Y'all know anything about a car on its last leg? Uh, we had already made up in our mind uh, that if we drive the car all the way to Long Beach, to go see Cal if he don't give us another car we gonna have to walk back because this car ain't gonna make it back to where we live uh, and I remember walking in and showing the guy I said listen uh, we don't have that much of a down payment we don't make that much money and what was interesting about it is the guy said well let me show you some vehicles and the first car he brought out it was a it was a minivan we were shopping for a minivan and first car he bought out looked like a box oh uh, y'all and I'm feeling that um Y'all know them cars that look like it's just a rectangle on wheels. It was one of them. It was an Aerostar. Now, if you drive Aerostar, Brother Tyson, sorry, but it looked like a box. And uh, I, I, I remember looking at it, and Jim looked at me, and she was like, mm -mm. And I looked at him, and I said, sir, that looks like a box. He says, oh, you don't like this one? Let me find another one. And he went and drove another one up, and it was just too old. And I was thinking to myself, I ain't buying no car that's this old. Uh, you know, I, it just, you know, we got a long payment on it. I don't want to drive that. And the car be older than Methuselah trying to drive it back and forth to work. And he says, oh, it's too old. And he just kept pulling out cars until finally he got a car that was in our price range. 
it was uh, in, in our year range. Amen, somebody. I'm glad we went and saw Kyle. And I, I remember when you got to fill out the paperwork because they're getting ready to run your credit. I looked at Jen. She looked at me. We said a little prayer uh, in our own minds as that man ran our credit. Then he came back, amen, somebody, and said, well, uh, here's the keys. And I'm thinking, keys? We got past the credit check. He was writing it up, putting it in our name. You got to know God will provide. He leaves the land God promised him, but he didn't believe God could provide for him inside of the promise. Are y'all going to get that in a second? See, God has promised us some great things even today, but we will rather trust in ourselves than trust in the provision of the one who made the promise in the first place. Amen. When all y'all looking at me funny, that's all right. That's all right. The Bible says that uh, the famine came. And so he goes, he goes to Egypt now because Egypt is the place where they always have plenty of food. The reason being is not because it rained in Egypt, but because of the Nile River. And the Nile River once a year would overflow its banks. And when it overflows its banks, uh, what, what would happen is it would produce marsh land that was good for growing crops. And so the Egyptians figured out a way to, to, to irrigate the land and to siphon off uh, the overflow of the water from the Nile. And so you would go to a place uh, in Africa now where no rain would ever fall, but they had the biggest fruit. They had the best vegetables. They had the most wonderful trees and bushes and plants because because God will provide water for them in that part of the world simply by overflowing uh, the Nile River. And so uh, in the Middle East now, in the ancient Near East, when, when people in Canaan or Mesopotamia or wherever uh, ran into famine and didn't have food, they would always go down to Egypt because Egypt always had food. Uh, so that's the reason why that's the reason why Abram takes off and he heads down to Egypt. But now we got a problem. The text says in verse number 11, and it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarah his wife, "Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Now, 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 now. Before, before we jump on Abram too bad, one of the, the most prime mistakes uh, that he makes that we can really relate to uh, is that people in, 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 in Canaan and, 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 and in the patriarchal age, they believe that uh, their God, whoever he might have been, was territorial. What that means is as long as you were in his land, God had your back. But the moment you cross the borders into another God's land, your God's power ceased, and now you were under the power of another God. And so Abram now, when he leaves Canaan, he thinks he leaves God behind. But Abram don't understand that the God he just chose to serve is the God of Canaan, the God of Egypt, the God of Mesopotamia, and the God of every other place. But in his mind, he had compartmentalized God. He had said, well, God can be the Lord of my religious life. God can be the Lord of this part of my life. But in other parts of my life, I, I'll provide for myself. Y'all looking at me funny. I want you to understand. He gets, down to, he gets down to Egypt now, and he's afraid because his wife is fine. Y'all know the story. Bible says Sarah. Now, this woman's 65 years old, and she's fine. And she fine even for a young woman. Uh, 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 I told y'all I went to school with a girl we called the Eclipse. She was so fine you couldn't look her straight in the face. I told y'all that, right? I want you to understand now, we got to trust God to be the God of our relationships with people. First and foremost, we can't be afraid of the Egyptians. We can't be afraid to tell the truth about our wife. We can't be afraid of anything because we understand that God is the God of people. He is the God of our relationships. Therefore, we got to trust God with any and every relationship we have. 
at this point, Abram is not willing to trust God in his future relationship with the Egyptians. He ain't willing to trust God uh, in the fact that Sarah is actually his wife. And, and let me show you something that, that Abram does. Abram uh, deceives us. What he does is he tells a half truth. Y'all know what it means to tell a half truth? Now, 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 we've already learned that Sarah is actually his sister. Sarah is his sister. His father had many wives, and they had different mamas, but, 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 but they had the same daddy. So, so he was telling the truth when he said, this is my sister. But he wasn't telling all the truth. Oh, y'all missing me. Uh, now, I told you I was raised old school, and my father believed that a lie was one falsehood that you told or any truth you was trying to conceal. Oh, uh, y'all missing that. Y'all missing that. Y'all missing that. Uh, 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 since how all the kids got the back-to-school stuff and the CST test and all this other kind of stuff, I remember the night before parent-teacher conference, my father would get me, Todd, and Timothy uh, in the room, and he would say, now, I'm going to visit your teacher tomorrow. Is there anything you need to tell me? Now, see, that's a trick question, y'all. <laughs> because if there's something you try to hide and you say, oh, no, nothing, and he finds out tomorrow from your teacher you've been cutting up in class, you don't want to be home when he get home. Uh, amen, somebody. Uh, 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 and, and Abram, Abram now, is, is trying, trying to control the situation. See, at this point, he don't think God can save his hide. Or his wife, if he tells them, yeah, she fine and she belonged to me. He's scared. Which also means Abram don't believe that God can protect him. A and the problem with that is, as, 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 as we'll all find out, God is a God of protection. Y'all need to understand now, the God we serve, don't leave you by yourself to fend for yourself. God protects those that belong to him. If we're going to mark some territory, we need to make sure we tell everybody we know the God we serve, watch this now, is going to provide, he's going to take care of my relationships, and the God I serve is going to protect me. That's right. When I choose to do right, God's going to protect me. When I choose to tell the truth instead of lying, God's going to protect me. When I step out on faith and do what's right, God's going to protect me. I'm not going to be afraid of the Egyptians. Why? Because God is going to protect me. All right, let's keep reading. I'm just going through the text line by line here. I'll give you a couple points and we're going to go home. The Bible says, Bible says, so please, verse number 13, please say, that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. I want you to watch something now. There is a double purpose in that statement. First of all, he wants her to lie so that one, it may be well with him. Then it says, so that I may live. It being well with him and him living is two different things. Now, you would think he just wants to stay alive. But he says, listen, tell him you my sister so that it might be well with me. Now, why would it be well? Well, if the Egyptians believe uh, that this is his sister and that she's unmarried, they're going to they're gonna tell Pharaoh, man, this bad chick came on the scene, man. You got to check her out. And Pharaoh is going to want to add Sarah to his harem. Now, can I show you the lust of the world? He got plenty of women at his disposal. And he wants this 65, amen, somebody, <laughs> year old lady that belonged to somebody else. See how the world act? They, they're not comfortable with what they have. They want what you have too. Amen, Walls. Amen, Walls. All right. So, so if Pharaoh decides he wants to add Sarah to his harem, 
Well, he's got to negotiate with her brother to buy her so that he can marry her. And, and so what that means is Pharaoh is going to be willing to exchange goods so that he can have Sarah's hand in marriage. Y'all know what that means? Abraham is getting ready to get paid, y'all. Because Pharaoh is going to pay top dollar for somebody that fine. Oh, y'all missing that. Y'all missing that, brothers. Y'all know we will pay an arm and a leg. Amen. If we think she looked that good. All right. So, so, so when he tells her, he tells her, listen, uh, tell them you're my sister that it may be well. They'll treat me right and they'll let me live. But I want you to watch this, though. He makes a he makes a grave mistake. Look at what the scripture says in verse 13, that I may live because of you. No, Abram, you walk in the promise and you will live because God protects you. Not because you uh, deceive Pharaoh and because of your wife you live. You live because God determines. Somebody missing that. Somebody missing that. All right, let me give you these last two. Last two really quickly because I want to bring it. I want to bring it all the way home for you. Um, we also must understand, brothers and sisters, that in your life, uh, if we're going to let worldliness go, we have to understand and make God the God of our plans. Y'all see the peas forming here? All right. Y'all know what that means? You're you going to have to learn to give your desire to God. Many of us are scared to give our desire to God because if we did, he may change our desire and we may not end up where we thought we should be. Amen, somebody. Uh, we, we start off going one way, but when we learn to trust God, we realize there's some other places we need to go on the way to where we thought we were going. And when we get to those places, we realize that they're more important there than they would be in the place we was headed in the first place. Uh, I don't know if you ever started off traveling someplace, but you get sidetracked and you end up spending more time in one place and you never do make it to your destination to do what, you did, what it is you wanted to do. But you realize God shows to you in the midst of the journey uh, where your desire really should lie. Amen. You don't start off wanting to be an elder, Brother Davis, but when you just serve God, guess where he'll take you? He'll change that desire and have you doing stuff you and you in your own mind never thought. Somebody gonna help me out. See, 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 I, I, I didn't originally go to school to study theology. Amen, somebody. You didn't originally come to California to be a Sunday school teacher. Amen, somebody. You, 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 didn't, you didn't start off on this path uh, to be a leader in the Lord's church. But guess what? When you learn to trust him, God will take your desire and your plan, and he will shape them into what they need to be for his purpose. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let me give you one more. Let me give you one more as we mark our territory. Uh, the last one I want you to understand is that uh, when we trust God, God also must be the God of promotion. I want you to understand this. We have to trust God that he's going to make us and mold us into the people he wants us to be. And that we cannot be so self-sufficient that we end up doing damage to people or to ourselves by trying to promote our own will and way. Many people still struggle with being worldly. Why? Because they're into self-promotion. The thing about self-promotion, uh, brothers and sisters, is that when you make ways to make a way for yourself, if that's not in the plan of God, it ain't going to last, nor will it stand. God will put you in the place he wants you to be. The problem that we have is we're such trying to make our own way and provide for ourselves. We don't trust that God will promote us to the place we think we should be. But the Bible says that if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt us in due time. Now, I want you to watch this. Abram is supposed to remember and keep his eyes now on the promise. The problem is, is he has forgotten about the promise. He forgot about the promise, and that's the reason why he headed on down to Egypt. 
Why? Because he didn't think God could provide for him inside the promise still remaining in Canaan. So now he's dealing with people he shouldn't have had to deal with in the first place. But because he thinks he's going to provide for himself food instead of trusting God of the promise to provide for him within the famine, within Canaan, he goes down and has to deal with Egyptians that don't care about him at all. When he gets down there now, instead of trusting God of the promise with his beautiful wife at his side and trusting God of the promise to help him deal with the Egyptians, he decides to take people into his own hands. He manipulates one. He deceives another. He's lying. He's cheating. He's coming up the wrong way. How can you say that, preacher? The Bible teaches us that Abram then exchanges goods for Sarah, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, uh, then the princes, verse 15, a Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. Y'all know what that means? That they went to Pharaoh bragging about how good she looked. He said, man, you got to see her. And so what happens? The Bible says, the Bible says, uh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And he treated Abram well for her sake. How well did he treat him? He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, camels. I told y'all she was fast. A lot of money to be paying for. Amen, somebody. Y'all see that? Now, Abram made money out of the deal. But he forgot about the promise. The promise says, God says, I will bless you. He also said in the promise that your wife is going to bear you a son. Now, if she goes off and marries another man, whatever son she have is not your son. And that's not the promise of God. But because he was nervous about uh, the Egyptians killing him, he lied and then entered into a contract with Pharaoh. And the Bible says Pharaoh just started pouring stuff on him, man. Female and male donkeys and oxen and, and all kind of uh, camels. And as a matter of fact, if you do your homework closely enough, uh, they gave him uh, servants. You know, one of the servants that Abram and Sarah picked up in Egypt was Haggai. That's right, Haggai. And Haggai is the one that's going to get Sarah and Abram in trouble in a few chapters. Am I right about him? If he wouldn't have never went to Egypt, he wouldn't have never had Hagar, she would have never uh, offered Hagar to her husband and we wouldn't have had Ishmael because that wasn't a part of God's plan. Y'all see that? So he got himself into trouble. So the Bible says that even though Abram is messing up, even though he's walking outside of the promise, that the God Abram serves, integrity is so good and so strong that God protects the promise even when we don't live within the promise. Well, preacher, how does God protect the promise? Look at what God does. And Sarah now has just been sold to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is getting ready to marry her. Now, you got to understand something. Uh, in biblical thinking now, uh, your wife don't become your wife until you consummate the marriage. We all understand that? So up until this point, he didn't pay the price, but ain't no consummation. All right. And before we get consummation, God steps in the picture. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. Now, look, look, look at this. Pharaoh is getting ready to speak sense into old Abram. You would think Abram would know my better than this. Look at what Pharaoh tells him. Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her 
and go. Y'all see that? Now, the one who had most sense was the one who's in the world and the one that was walking in the promise. Y'all see that? Y'all see that? So, 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 so the problem that we have is Abram found out. Now, the scripture don't tell us how Pharaoh found out. I don't know whether Sarah told him, well, you know, I'm actually his wife. I don't know if God sent somebody else to tell Pharaoh. Scriptures don't say. But he figured out now when he put Sarah in his harem, that's when the problem started. The plagues came and plagued his household. And so he got to be thinking, she brought bad luck. Something must be wrong with this one. All right? Uh, 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 and so, so he tells, he tells uh, Abram, why did you lie to me, man? Why didn't you just tell me she was your wife? Then he, then he sends him on his way. And you know where he sends him? Back to the place God told him to go in the first place. Y'all see that? Take your stuff and go. Look at what the last verse in the text says. So Sarah commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all they had. Now, can I show you something in the text? Pharaoh didn't ask for them donkeys back. Pharaoh didn't ask for them oxen back, camels back, nor them servants back. He said, take all your stuff I gave you. We ain't got to exchange nothing else. Get your junk and get so Pharaoh told him. Now, can I show you something? God allowed uh, Pharaoh to bless Abram when Abram was told to bless Pharaoh. Remember now, God promised him, said, listen, anybody you bless, I'm going to bless. Anybody you curse, I'm going to curse. Anybody mess with you, I'm going to mess with them. But what, is, what does Abram do? Abram, Abram ends up leaving with more than he came with. Y'all see that? Now, now, let me wrap this thing up for you. Brothers and sisters, first thing we got to do if we're going to overcome worldliness is we got to stay and live within the promise of God. You got to stay focused on the promise of God. Now, 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 what does this look like? Well, preacher, I'm learning to give on Sunday. But let me tell you something. You got to understand, if you give by faith, God will give back to you. First and foremost, you breathe in his air. Now, if God made you pay for his air, how much would it be worth to you? Probably more than the two or three trinkets we drop in the plate on Sunday. Am I right about it? It'd be more than that. Even the greatest giver that Crenshaw's ever seen probably would pay more money to breathe every day. Am I right about it? We got to trust God with our provisions. Watch this. When our bank account finally is on empty and we don't know how it got that way, we still got to trust God. Amen. In our relationships with people, guess what? You got to trust God. You got to trust God when you want to give your boss a piece of your mind. You got to trust God that all the mind God gave you is for you. And you don't need to be giving none of it away. You got to trust God that even though your wife or your husband's acting up, you still going to do right by them because that's what God said do. And you're going to trust that he is going to protect you even if they're scheming on you. Amen, somebody. You got to trust that God is going to protect you. That's right, in all your goings. You got to trust that God is going to see you through. You got to trust. Let me tell you something. You can't trust your 357 Magnum. You can't trust Smith & Wesson. You can't trust Brinks and ADT. You can't trust your Rottweiler and your German Shepherd. You got to trust God. Amen. When it comes to where you want to go in life, you got to trust God. See, m m many times we leave God out of this part of the equation. Why? Because we're selfish. One mark of worldliness is selfishness. What did Pharaoh want? Had all the wives he could have and still wanted more. When you learn to trust God with your desires, you realize that sometimes our desires are very much selfish. When it comes to achieving your goals, 
we must understand that God needs to be the, your God of promotion. That you should not try to step on this one to be number one. You should not try to outdo folk trying to get ahead of the game. God will bless you to go where he wants you to be. What we have to learn to do is trust in the God of the promise. Now, the question is then, what did God promise? Well, scriptures teach us that Jesus himself said that he's with us even until the end of the age. So you know what that promise is? His presence. The Bible says, the Hebrew writer says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's God's presence. That means no matter how lonely you feel, God is still there. Or preach out, I go home to an empty house. God presence is still there well my husband is dead and gone and my wife left me and my children are grown and gone god blesses you with his presence the scriptures teach us that uh that the children of god have never gone without that god blesses us with his provisions all the time do we trust him do we trust him to still give of our means when we know we don't have that much money amen somebody are we like the woman with two mites that's willing to throw in our last when we don't know where our next is coming from? Amen, somebody. It got quiet, didn't it? Are we going to trust God with our relationships in our life? See, sometimes we will break God's promise trying to keep somebody, amen, instead of trusting God that he will provide us exactly what we need. Now, can I just be honest with you? Young lady, you think that if you sleep with him, what's going to happen? He's going to marry you. Don't trust that trust in the God of the promise we take our eyes off the promise and then we end up getting hurt anyway amen somebody we go out of our way to try to protect ourselves. why because we're afraid of getting hurt we don't open up we don't share we don't get to learn people and love people for who and what they are because we don't know what want nobody to hurt our feelings but let me tell you something Jesus made himself vulnerable for sinners like you and me the scripture says he put on flesh and became not only a human but a human servant and was obedient even to the point of the cross Jesus made him himself vulnerable for you and for me my question tonight for you is that are you going to walk within the precious promise of God he loves you he provides for you he protects you God blesses you he does so many things the question is do you trust him with all you have Many people want to compartmentalize God. We give him our church life and we give him our spiritual life, but we don't give him our finances. We don't give him our marriage. We don't give him our children. We don't give him our job situation. We don't give him those things, but God is still the God of those things too. The question tonight is, are you learning to trust in God? If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ, and the pardon of your sins, you're going to have to learn to step out on faith and trust God with your eternity. Everybody in this room has decided to make up their mind to trust God with their soul. So when we die, guess what? We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about the grave because we recognize the one who made a promise to us holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Everybody in this room has decided to give their life to Christ, but there may be one person who's still walking outside of that promise. You come to him by faith, hearing and believing in the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the fact that he hung between two thieves after living a perfect life. And the Bible says he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. They buried him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb and he got up early on Sunday morning. That empty grave proves that our Savior lives. You come by uh, not only faith, hearing, and believing, but you must repent of your sins and confess with your mouth that he's the Christ. We bury you in water. You come up a new creature. If you're here and you're already a Christian, but you've been walking outside of the promise, ain't no shame in that. We're all learning to lean on Jesus. We're all learning to give God our relationships. We're all learning to trust him with our advancement in life. We're all learning to trust God with our plans, but you need to make a recommitment tonight. Rededicate yourself right now to the Lord that you're going to trust him in every avenue of your life because as long as you still try to do it for yourself you're going to always get nothing because anything you do for yourself is nothing brothers and sisters it's not second best it's not third best it's nothing because you're living outside of the promise of God 
Or preacher, I got to make my own way because ain't nobody to look out for me. No, God will look out for you. But you mean to tell me I'm supposed? Yeah, I mean to tell you that you need to trust in God. That's who you need to trust. You don't need to lie to nobody. You are too brave to lie. Lying is for cowards. You know why? Because they want to cover the truth because they're afraid of what you're going to think of them if they told the truth. You don't have to be scared of nobody. You're too generous to cheat. You give people whatever. If they want to take it, Jesus said, give them the shirt off your back and your coat too. They say, walk a mile, walk with them a mile, go another mile on top of it. Brother Moore, they're going to make me feel bad. Let them make you feel bad. If Jesus could get slapped on the face and didn't do nothing wrong, I can take verbal punishment off a person who's crazy. Amen. But she might think she have the upper hand. Let her think that she might have the upper hand. You realize God is the only one with a hand. Do you trust in the God of the promise? If you're here tonight, you need to respond to the message. We beg you to do so right now. As together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Will you come tonight? Sing his mercy and his grace. Do we have one tonight? We beg you to come. He'll prepare for us a place to win. When the saved get to heaven, oh, what a day rejoicing that will be. Oh, when the saved see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. We walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Oh, when the and the saved get to.